Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll just check out that this is going to work quickly. I'm going to use the pointer a bit, and uh, as Dr. Lee kindly uh, reminded me, it is the talk before lunch. I, I'm reassured that in an obesity lecture, we're going to have kale for lunch, perhaps ah. some green smoothies, so nobody's going to be rushing away to get some kale. So I'm hoping that we'll stay. I've got images just to keep people entertained. Um, and I'd like to thank Peter for inviting me along. Where is Peter hiding around there? Dr. Wysohi. Over there. Thanks, Peter, for inviting me along. Um, thanks also for the administration team that get these things running. We all know, having run conferences ourselves, how difficult it is and how much we rely on you. And also, just thanks to all the colleagues that have come along today. PA was where I trained, and a lot of my interest in medicine and radiology persists from the staff that I met while I was at PA. It's, it's good to be a radiologist. We help out a lot of people. We help out patients. Hopefully, we also help out clinicians that we work with, and that's what I'm going to hope to do today, is show some things that help everybody understand a bit about radiology and its limitations in the setting of obesity. Uh, rates of obesity, we've talked about this already, but this is the important range for us in some ways, I suppose, the, the older population. Um, where from 25% were obese in 1995, we're up to 40% of the elderly are now obese, which is nearly the norm. These are the people we're dealing with every day. Uh, sorry about that microphone. Louder than I anticipated. Um, and that's why we've got to get used to dealing with it. It's, it's the change. So we used to, radiologists are very slow to change. We like our equipment to stay the same. We like to say, well, that's not how we used to do it. Uh, but we've found out that we have to keep up, and often it's clinician read. So a lot of changes through radiology are actually led from clinicians recognizing the versatility or the utility of radiology and saying, let's use it this way. And often we say, no, there's too much radiation, it's after hours. But actually, it has a good outcome. And this is what radiologists have to remember. Everything changes all the time, and you have to, to live with that change in surgeons, physicians, nursing staff. Everybody's living with obesity, and it's changing rapidly as we go through our practice. So that's why this is a good conference, to see how other people are doing it. Um, so adapt we must. Uh, so I'm going to go quickly today through the physical effects of obesity on imaging, so that's uh, logistical issues, and then talk about some of the modalities and where they're limited by weight. Um, so physical effects, the weight of patients and radiation dosage. So this is real. Um, equipment in the early 2000s had weight limits of about 150 kilograms, and that's not that much. And at PA, for instance, we had a 20-year-old fluoroscopy table. It could manage 120 kilos, and that's partly of the fluoroscopy table is, is a large cantilever. And if you have the patient on the end, because it has to be thin enough to get x-rays through it, it's a massive weight on a long... So carbon fiber was invented, but it still can't handle 200 kilos to two meters away from a table. So there's weight limitations. And at Logan, we used to manage this. This is in Stuart's time as well, before we got the 250 kilo weight limit. We just scanned at the end of the day, because when the patients would break the scanner, it was OK, because you could usually get them overnight. Everybody knew how to fix a broken scanner. But you can't scan big people at the limits of table at the early day, because there's 35, 40 CTs being done that day. So 40 people will be affected if you image an obese patient early in the day at the borderlines of your scanning equipment. And sometimes it'll break for days. So this is a, it's a, true, it's a true issue. The equipment gets bigger. Uh, now it's up to 300 kilograms in some circumstances. So these are the ones that mainly affects CT, fluoroscopy, and MR. Fluoroscopy is still a bit slow to change because the equipment's not well rebated and, and it's not liked by radiologists generally because you have to meet people, you have to play with barium, it's messy. So that's, uh, so the fluoroscopy equipment will be slow and it's because nobody's really that keen on it anyway as a modality. Um, so the other physical effects are the actual diameter of the magnet or CT. Uh, Stuart was pointing that out today. 50 centimetres or 60 centimetres is actually quite narrow for an obese patient. He was talking about stretcher transport. So MR actually had a 50 centimetre weight limit, uh, sorry, width, and the wide bore becomes 60 centimetres. And a lot of people promote that now. It has reasons for claustrophobia, because MR and CT are actually not that physically limited by weight. They're physically limited, you just can't fit the patient in the scanner. So they are too tight. They always talk about putting butter on to push people in, because if you can get them into the scanner, you can get an image. If you can't get them into the scanner, you can't get anything. So, so it's actually a true limitation. Um, and the CTs are getting even now. Now they're 70 centimetres. So it is changing. Most of the equipment's not quite there yet. But this is an example of, of you just can't fit people in. And, that, and these gentlemen aren't that huge. I wouldn't have thought in the grand scheme of things for people <laughs> that are used to doing OB. But you can see how tight it is. And MR is tighter than CT. And, and you can fit a patient in MR. You can imagine a bit overhangs on each side. And with cooperation, you can get good imaging. CT, difficult, uh, more difficult because there's some artifact where you touch the side of the scanner because it's radiation directly being produced near where the skin is. So um, 
And then the US market drives all of this. So all radiology that, uh, for obesity comes from the US. And uh, this is the really big one. So 300 kilo target limit, 85 centimetres. And I'll talk a bit about interventions, because I do a lot of interventions under CT and how they limit us a bit. But it is to do with the diameter of the tube and trying to fit a needle and a patient in and out of that tube while they're there. So um, an important part, and this is a long term. So we don't always think long term in medicine. Um, perhaps physicians think long term because of some of the lifestyle factors. But uh, this is a, probably a thing we need to think about more. It's the radiation dose from obese patients. And they looked at this recently, and they have what we call, so for radiation dosage, there's two ways of looking at it. One is just the amount of radiation. Two is actually looking at the amount of radiation and where it affects the organs that get hurt. So that's your gonads or your neck. And then there's also an age characteristic. So a normal chest X-ray is 0.2 of a millisievert. So the same risk of cancer as a single smoke if you get the chest X-ray. That's the same risk of developing cancer is one chest X-ray from one cigarette. That's your risk. So it's a very low risk. Nobody thinks about it. Four tablespoons of peanut butter will also give you a risk of cancer from aflatoxin in your liver. So they're, they're two minutes of rock climbing, all, all of these are risks of death, and we try and explain these things all the time to patients <laughs> and other people. They're not easily known. Then you have background radiation. So a single chest X-ray is two days of background radiation. Every day we get radiation, um, but this is where it gets scary. So an abdominal X-ray in a very awake subject is somewhere between 2 and 16 millisieverts. And so now we're looking at around 91 days of radiation in the background. And a single X-ray, that's only one X-ray, we're not serial X-rays. And if we get really bad, so a barium enema in an obese patient, we're talking about 42 millisieverts. Now, your average CT in, in me is about eight millisieverts, so that's not much, and that's an abdominal CT, it's low. But you can see coronary angiography, 100 millisieverts for a very overweight patient. And that's who CT coronary angiography is tailored at. So we're talking significant doses of radiation. In some cases, you can't see because the slide's off the back, but in a very overweight subject, we were talking about eight years of radiation in a single day, just from a single exam. So this is where it's important. At 28 millisieverts, four abdominal radiographs, one in 170 cases will develop cancer from those four radiographs. Mm. So that's, that's a significant risk. Uh, that's a risk that you should tell your patients. Um, the models are flawed, so nobody really knows about radiation. Most of it's done from Hiroshima. And, and believe it or not, from Hiroshima, other than the people that died in the initial bomb blast and radiation and illness, it was only about 200 people that died from cancer from radiation in the future from Hiroshima. People did have radiation-related neoplasms, but they didn't kill them. They were just low-level thyroid being an example of it. So radiation is actually pretty safe. If only 200 people in Hiroshima died, it's not, it's not dead. But even on that model, one in 170 cases, you will cause a cancer sometime in their lifetime. Most radiology cancers happen when you're 70 to 90 anyway. So you get exposed when you're 20, but you're going to get the cancer when you're 70 to 90. So it doesn't happen straight away. But it means you do have to think about repeated CTs in really big patients or repeated examinations in really big patients, not because it makes a difference today. More, sometimes you can give them a few days before you get the next scan. The body's repair mechanisms work. Give them a bit of a break, and you can scan them again. But we do scan people without really realising how high that radiation is, and that's only four abdominal X-rays on a very obese patient. And everybody that's worked at hospitals have seen very obese patients get repeat X-rays because they need them. Who knows what's going on? So it's a test that's necessary. It's just a test that comes with a consequence. So if you can avoid it, but you're not imaging them because you like to image them. You're imaging them because it makes a difference, and that's all you have to ask yourself. Am I making a difference? So it is worthy of thinking about. Um, this is how we avoid radiation. So nowadays, we're decreasing it on CT through a lot of ways. So this is a scanogram. So before the CT scans, it takes a quick low-dose picture of a person and says, I don't need any CTs through this part of their chest. I'll drop the amperage on the CT before it even gets there. So the radiation through that bit's low. I do need a lot of radiation through here. Can't help it. I've got to get through the liver, the bowel, everything else. So I'll put the machine. So the machine then knows, oh, down here in the pelvis, I even need more. So instead of just giving a blanket dose of radiation, it on the fly reduces the radiation so that you get the minimum you need to get a good image. So that's part of what it does. It also has reconstruction, but that's math and, and it's not that interesting. How often, now this is the next part of it. So they're the physical effects of obesity on radiation. They're not actually that big, it's just logistical issues, getting a patient in and out, and, and, and dosage is important. This is the other one. So how often does it affect reporting. So obesity results in a poor quality report or a report that's not adequate or won't give you an answer. Now this is a big study, and it's the only one out there. It was five million reports. It's old now, it was 2003. But out of that five million reports, only 0.15% 
said that the habit is limited interpretation of the X-ray. It's not that much. Like it's it's a very low rate. Um, and of those patients, uh, the average weight of somebody that it wasn't in the it, you didn't use the term habitus limited was 71, and 108 kilos was was the term the average weight of the people where it was was found. So that's not it, it's interesting. So about 110, 120 kilos is where you begin to get imaging degradation, and the most the images, the modalities are most affected are ultrasound and chest radiography. So that's not much. It doesn't say CT, it doesn't say MR, it doesn't say abdominal X-rays. I think radiologists underreport it, but you can see the rate at which it was done. So it, it doubled over a 15-year period, the amount of people that were describing it, and I think it would have doubled again since that time, perhaps more. Uh, what, oh, there are some good points out of this study. While it's doubled, most low-level obesity doesn't affect us that much. Radiologists can work with it. Everybody can work with low-level obesity. It doesn't affect our imaging. We've come to it. Morbid obesity does affect us a lot, and that's what's driven most of the change in the equipment and the reporting and the consequence. It's, it's those extremes that force us to adapt. Um, so these are the modalities most affected. I'm going to show you how they are affected. Uh, so scatter. This is radiation. It doesn't matter if it's CT or an X-ray. You produce photons. They go through the person. They hit a bone. They don't hit the bit behind it, so it's white. So the white is no, no photons getting through. The problem is when you hit something hard, there's a scatter. It's as if it's, you throw a rock at something, it rebounds in a funny direction, and that's just hitting atoms with photons. And you can see if, if this atom gets hit here and sends out a scatter, this is actually much brighter than it would be otherwise because it's getting two bits of radiation instead of one, which is what it does. So that degrades your imaging, and this is an example of it. So a normal chest X-ray, an obese chest X-ray, and that's what scatter does. Can you see it's not sharp, the imaging... We, we can ramp up that 100%. We can put more energy through the patient, but it doesn't produce any better image because it's scattering. It's just blurring everything. So you just get a whiter image or a, or a blacker image, but it's no better image. So this is why chest x-ray. And we've all, this is an ICU standard film at Logan, as far as I've seen. <laughs> There's nothing. It's just it's run of the mill. And everybody's trying to look at what is going on. Who knows what's going on there? Like, we sort of know. You look at yesterday's, and it looks similar. But the patient's... <laughs> deteriorated, so something's going on, and, and that's why CT turns up. It's because it's hard, and, and you and I all take x-rays like that, and that's what we don't want, and that's with a grid, that's with everything going at our best. And this is abdominal x-rays, and this is why the abdominal x-ray is no good. It's the patients are now too big for an x-ray, so we can image the top of their abdomen, we can image the side of their abdomen, but we can't image their whole abdomen, so we can choose. So what often will happen with Logan is they'll turn the film on the side and do two landscape films, because a lot of them is actually off the film. You can't see it here, but they're all off the film. Yeah. And uh, hernias, all of these funny things, but you're not getting good enough image, and that's why you repeat the exam, and these are the ones that we're giving the highest radiation dose to. And compare it to that, which is just your stamp. He does have fat in him, because you can see his bladder being outlined, but we can see the psoas shadows, we can see soft tissue outlines. It's a good x-ray. That is very hard to interpret other than to say that they're obstructed or non-obstructed, or they're perforated or not perforated, and that's the limit to that test that you can say. You can't say much else about that. It's just a bad x-ray. So ultrasound, here's some examples. It's, it's the most affected by fat. It's, the energy is attenuated by fat uh, tissue, and here's an example. So 50% of the beam is lost every centimetre of fat, which is a huge amount, because we're only talking 24 decibels. It's not a huge amount of energy that you can put through somebody without making them hot or burning them. So in an obese patient, 8 centimetres of fat, only 6% of the original beam gets through. And remember, that's a sound wave. So essentially, ultrasound just hits the sound wave through, it, it bounces off the organ, and you record how long it takes to bounce back. If it doesn't actually get through, you can't record anything. <laughs> it's, it's just a limit of um, physics. At lower frequencies, it bounces less, but the problem is the lower frequencies, then your, your average frequency is so long it can't resolve any imaging detail. It's just the beam, you can't work it out where it is in space. So this is the distribution of fat is important in ultrasound. So this is gynecoid fat or female fat, buttocks anterior, very little intraperitoneal. You can see the ultrasound, if you could get through there, it's only a centimetre or two. Five minutes left. Sorry, that's 15 down? Five minutes to go? All right. Um, this is mixed female fat, so intra-abdominal, peritoneal, and there's a little hernia there as well. And this is male, so predominantly intraperitoneal fat. And that changes how you can use with an ultrasound. I'll show that in a second, CT. So a normal ultrasound of the kidneys, for the urologists and uh, everybody else that's amongst us, we all can see that it's a kidney. It's got a good cortex, it's got a medulla, there's the liver at the front. It's only one to two centimetres between this guy's flank and the, and the kidney. That's a kidney on an obese person. So we're not talking huge amounts. This is only five centimetres of fat between us and the kidney. 
But think of the imaging resolution that you've lost there to here. Who even knows what's going on at the bottom of that kidney? Anyway, it's hard. Obesity limits ultrasound. Here's an example of a liver with fatty hepatic steatosis. Can't see anything. Here's a normal liver and long with hepatic veins. You can see the diaphragm. It's a beautiful picture. But everybody hopes for that, but that's often what you get. And that's what we're limited. And when we say it's limited by habitus, you can't see anything. And, and, and this radiologists are trying to be helpful and they'll say, no mass seen. What they probably should say is, uh, that it doesn't really mean anything, no mass is seen, because there is no, there is no mass seen. Uh, but it do, so you need another test, and we're all reticent to order other tests. Well, all radiologists should be reticent to order another test. The only time I would ever order another test is if I think I can't make an educated judgment. And this is where radiologists fail, and this is why we continue to need to come to the conferences, is so they know what to say to say, look, I'm 10% confident only, or 50% confident. There has to be. It's not black or white radiology. Giving a black or white radiology report is is bad. Well, it's like saying that stuff was bright. What does that mean? Who cares whether there's bright stuff in the kidney? Is it, is it an angiomyelopoma? Is it a tumour? What confident, how confident are you are between the two? And that's what we should be doing. So this is obstetrics. So this heart here is 1.5 centimetres long. So that's 1.5 centimetres. Like, that's how big that heart is. And it shows you how good imaging is. We can see the heart valves. So they're open. Sorry, open, closed. So that's, that's obstetric imaging for a normal morphology exam. It's phenomenal resolution. There's the heart on an obese patient. Now, what are we meant to do with that? Mm. So in private, that's $215 to the patient. Uh, they say, well, you didn't see anything. You couldn't rule in or rule out. And you say, damn right, I can't see anything. There's nothing to, s there's nothing to see. So uh, there's, yeah, well, you just, you can't report on it. So, um, so we get around it. We do transvaginal versus transabdominal. You can see through the vagina, it's only five centimeters to the uterus. Anteriorly through the abdominal fat, it's 10 centimeters. So we have different ways of increasing our imaging. And this is a uterus transabdominally, bladder, skin, uterus with a bit of endometrium. Here's the endometrium through a transvaginal exam. You can see it clearly run through. And for gynecologists and obstetricians, we all know how good that scan is, as opposed to that which you're guessing at. A shoulder, there's another one that's quick, but we'll, I'm running out a bit of time on that. So here's quickly, this is some fluoroscopy that we do. So this is a standard gastric bypass. So, um, is it the standard? Yes, it is. Um, so here we see a pouch, the bypass through the loop and straight into the jejunum. And, and we do these a bit to make sure. Here's an abnormal one. So the esophagus is dilated, and you can't see this in the static image, but that esophagus continues to contract, contract, contract. Not much happens. You can see we've got a lot of contrast in here and a lot in here, as opposed to here, where we've gone straight through quickly in the small bowel. There's barely there. Within the first pass, we've moved a lot through there. And this one, this is a stricture of a bypass just through here. And, and you get achalasia or the equivalent of achalasia. Your esophagus continues to try and contract to move that. And here's the stricture through here. It, it's enough to cause symptoms. And this is what we do a little bit of fluoroscopy for. It, it ends up being a reasonable dose if the patient's still big. Um, here's your standard lap band. It's a laparoscopic band, small pouch above, working normally. And here's one where it's slipped up to the top. 